Um, so welcome everybody. My name is David Kramer. I am the director of the library at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And uh, we do all kinds of programming, but foremost among the programming that we do uh, is the privilege of having book talks like this with authors writing notable books of Jewish interest and in many cases, and certainly in this case, the authors are old friends of ours. Uh, I'll speak personally of mine. I, I've known you, know I'm for a very long time, uh, and it, it's really been a privilege to be able to have that contact over the course of the years. Uh, a couple of technical things. First of all, um, I encourage everybody who is now hiding behind their name on a dark screen, um, if you're, you know, presentable, if it won't uh, compromise too much, make yourself seen. That way the author can see you. And uh, speaking as someone who does communicate uh, through Zoom a lot, it's a lot nicer to see people who are listening to you than merely to be speaking at the screen. If, of course, you want to stay behind it, that is your privilege. But uh, you've heard my encouragement. Uh, there will also, Gloria Beeler has started sharing her screen I don't think we intended that. So I'm going to, um, a, 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 we're, <laughs> there, we're back to where we should be. Um, Noam will share his screen in a little while. Uh, let me encourage you to keep yourselves on mute so that uh, we can hear the author. And I am very aggressive at the mute button. So after Noam begins, I am going to, um, you know, open up my participants bar. And if anybody strays off of mute, I promise I will put you back on very, very quickly in order that we can hear the author. So um, let me just step back and say something about the book. Uh, Noam, you just, for those who are already logged on, said something about your project over the course of many years. Uh, and it is a noble and notable project uh, you are both a, a, an exceptional teacher uh, and a notable scholar, and we are all uh, at in your debt to be able to learn from the things that you have put together, published. Uh, I had forgotten, actually, wh when I opened up this book to prepare my uh, introduction, that I had blurbed it. And I was yes. actually pleased to see that the blurb was included here. And I stand behind every word. Uh, this is a very, very important resource. Uh, some of you may, who are familiar with the field may have asked yourself why after, I think it's probably fair to describe the golden age of gender and sexuality studies in the Jewish setting as having been during the 80s into the early 90s. Uh, so you may have wondered, why is it time now to readdress this question? Uh, and you will learn the answer to that, but I'll say a couple of words about it. The subtitle of this book, Sanctified Sex, is the 2000 year Jewish debate on marital intimacy. Uh, one of the things that those of us who have had occasion to read about and study this before, will have noticed is that authors, depending upon who they are, uh, will probably have focused more on one side of attention in Jewish sources than on the other. Uh, but that tension is very, very important. There is a genuine debate within Jewish tradition uh, that goes back for 2,000 years, as the subtitle suggests. And uh, it's worth being aware of that debate and how the tension comes to be struggled over and expressed. One side of it celebrates the uh, embodied part of who we are and affirms that part, celebrates the pleasure that our bodies can take uh, in regulated settings. And then the question, of course, arises, what kind of regulation is appropriate or not? But at the same time, there is also a side of the tradition that is much more hesitant to celebrate that, much more restrictive, and there is a bona fide tension between them. Uh, what Noam does in this book is to dive deep into both sides of this with sources from the earliest rabbinic sources, to be fair, even from biblical sources, all the way through the most recent rabbinic writings and related. 
uh, and there is much to discover here. However well educated you are uh, in this question, I promise that you will learn something from Noam's book. Uh, and so let's get a tasting of that, a sample of it. Please uh, keep your questions. Um, you're welcome to put them in chat at any time, and I will uh, gather the questions, and there will be time at the end for those questions to be expressed. But we're a large enough number that uh, it would really not work to have individuals call out their own questions, so I'll keep a record of them, and I will read them to Noam after he's finished with his presentation. So, Noam Tsion, please. Lovely. Okay, let me just expand this for a moment. We'll start with a pretty picture at the very least. I hope it's large enough for everyone. So this is the official uh, cover that they have. Uh, a beautiful purple and a picture I'd never seen before by Marc Chagall called The Kiss. And the topic, as you will see, has to do with marital intimacy, both emotional as well as erotic. And therefore, the book is not about some of the questions of the 1980s, is Judaism pro-sex or anti-sex, issues that I certainly uh, learned a great deal from the gender studies. It's not strictly a book about gender, although, of course, gender is, imp is implicated in everything we do, certainly in marriage. And it's also not a book that addresses very important questions having to do with, uh, with gay marriages and uh, polymor uh, polymorphy and various notions like that. It's a book which is specifically about, if you will, the how-to of having a marital intimacy. And I'm interested in that halachic aspect, that how-to aspect, if you will, that Jewish catalog aspect of guidance to how we live our lives and how we make our relationships, whatever the genders of those relationships are, deeper and stronger. And I'm interested both in the halacha of that and the agada of that. And here I'll be using halacha in multiple ways, but my general approach is to follow Maimonides, who in the More Nevuchim, as a description of, of the Torah, and he says the Torah is a book of etzah. It's a book of wisdom literature, giving us wisdom to how we live our lives. And from Maimonides, that means how to become fully human, which also means to be fully sacred, and which also means to have a healthy and a good life. And it's in that sense that I'm interested in the discussions and the debates, both halachic and agadic, in the debate about marital intimacy. Um, I suppose the person who really defines the purpose of my book is a person I don't like at all, although he has a nice formulation, and that is the famous student Kahana in his voyeuristic visit underneath his teacher's, underneath his teacher's bed, a famous story, and I'm going to come back to it because it's really the core of what the book is about. So here's the story. We'll do it in English. Rav Kahana, he's just Kahana in those days, went in under Rav's bed in Babylonia. In other words, this is a form of bugging the bedroom. He's under the bed, as in the photograph I'm using here. So he actually can only figure out from the sounds and the conversations. He can't actually see what's happening. Kahana went in under Rav's bed. He heard him chatting and jesting. Sach v'sachak, which are alliterative. There's a playfulness and there's a conversational element. So with multiple translations would be chatting and jesting, playing and laughing, or engaging in foreplay. And then in that process, through that conversation and that back and forth, comes gratifying his needs. And in other rabbinic sources, that also involves gratifying her needs. So the physiological and the emotional interactive go together. And then Kahana pipes up. It seems as if the mouth of Abba, which is both the first name of Rav and, of course, also a name of honor towards a teacher. It's not clear whether he's, this is a, a audacious using of the first name of his teacher or it's a way of honoring his teacher. Rav replied, Kahana, are you there? Get out, for it is not the way of the world. It's not Derech Eretz for you to be under there. But Kahana answered, this too is Torah, and to learn I must. So that's clearly my theme. There is in this privacy, and of course Rav is correct to protect the privacy of his bedroom. If you don't have privacy, you can't have intimacy, you can't have trust, you can't have revealing yourself except in a relationship where you can really count on the, the partner. If there is voyeurism, there's no room for that. 
And yet Kahana is very different in his notion of this is Torah and I learn must than, for example, Rabbi Akiva, in which the same phrase is used when Akiva is in the outhouse with his teacher, also seeing how his teacher Osed Tzrachav, the way he gratifies his physical needs. And Akiva is very happy to learn from his teacher. Now, in both cases, both Kahana, both the bedroom and the bathroom, or without the euphemism, an outhouse, um, are both places in which it says, if you want to really learn Judaism, it's not about dogma, and it's not about law in general. It's about an embodied Torah of how you live out your life in relationship for the more complicated aspects of your life in terms of your yitzarim, your various desires and your human needs. It's really only to be learned from a master to a student because the, the master, as I think Heschel used the term, is a text person. He is an embodied form of Torah. The problem with Kahana and what made it very interesting to me is, again, unlike Akiva, he's not happy to learn from his teacher. The opposite. He learns that what his teacher's behavior is totally unacceptable. He takes an opposite position to Rav. Rav is interested in the interactive, in the joyful, in the kalut rosh, in the lightness of spirit. And Kahana says, what is this? You're my teacher. This is not, you're not a teenager having sex for the first time. And yet you cheat this dish a language which, uh, which is close to the kind of very uh, chauvinist language that I used growing up when we talked about a, a beautiful girl as a, as a nice dish. Culinary language is very typical in discussing sexual issues within the Talmudic uh, uh, language. And he's, he does it very negatively. It's as if you never t tasted a dish before. How can you continue to get sexually excited about a relationship? You're not only a veteran husband, you're also a teacher who's supposed to teach wisdom. Certainly it's about kibush hayetzer. It's about transcending your physicality. And it's totally improper that you should be showing such desire. And perhaps, depending on other traditions of Kahana, maybe he objects to the whole notion of trying to win and to woo your partner into the relationship on the basis of consent. Now, what this brought me to was the notion of trying to figure out what is the debate that begins here on marital intimacy and emotional intimacy, as you see, and erotic intimacy. How's this debate developed? Now, at this point, nobody's talking about the sacred. That's not the issue. Um, and so if I, explain, if I explain why I'm interested in this topic, not for what purpose, the purpose being an embodied ethic of how to and how to improve that interpersonal relationship. But if I ask the question, why did I write the book from what was its origins? What really led me from my personal experience as an American Jew to write it? Then I think I have to go to Art Green. And so I'm going to take you back to the Jewish catalog, a book that you may still have on your shelves. And I'm taking you back to my personal history when I arrived at Columbia College and also at the Teachers Institute as a very naive student. My father's definition of sexual education when I was 13 was to show me a shelf he had of 30 different books by psychologists and therapists about sex and to say, read whatever you want. He wasn't he was never open to talk about that topic in a personal way. So I arrived without a great deal of knowledge, and I arrived precisely at the time that the American sexual revolution was taking part, along with all of the movements toward liberation. And it was at that time, so on one hand, I had to deal with the American sexual revolution, which was not only changing behaviors, it was changing an ideology. It was an ideology that challenged both Christian notions of, of sexuality, Eastern European halachic notions. It challenged uh, Victorian and bourgeois notions. And we saw ourselves as liberating ourselves by appreciating the natural goodness of what God had created in us. At the same time, I was involved in a second interesting transformation. That was the birth of the Chavura, the New York Chavura, the Boston Chavura, the Jewish catalog, and a, an attempt of American Jews to go back and reclaim what they could of Eastern European wisdom and mystical wisdom, as well as they were open, of course, to the Far East and to Buddhist wisdom. 
And they said, it's not that we want to imitate the modern world. It's not about how do we make Judaism fit into modern demands. It's how do we discover since something is deeply corrupt in the American values that brought us Vietnam, that brought the assassination of Martin Luther King. That's how we felt. We had to look back at wisdom literatures which were non-modern. And it's in that context, of course, of the Jewish catalog. And the Jewish catalog, as you may remember, is a how-to book. Uh, it all is, in that sense, a halachic book. It's about how do you make challah and how do you build a sukkah. And of course, one of the topics that they asked Art Green to write about was to write about sexuality and sexual ethics in the modern period. And here Art Green made, made an argument that really has pushed me into writing my book. He says, the Jewish catalog is a reflection of neo-traditional Jewish lifestyle that is evolving among certain young in spirit American Jews in Chavurot alternative communities. While these circles have tended toward traditionalism, but we are postmodern rather than pre-modern Jews. Our lifestyle is hardly to be considered halachic. It is in the areas of sexual relations and the place of women that this discrepancy between fully halachic traditionalism and neo-traditionalism of these new Jews is most clearly seen. And he went on to say, we have nothing to learn from the halachic tradition or the agadic tradition of the past. We need a new halacha and we need a new kabbalah in order to in order to build a new sexual ethics and a new sexual ethos for the Jewish people. Um, but at the same time as he was rejecting that there was anything to learn from rabbinic tradition, he also had the problem of that whole generation, and we see it among all of the rabbi, the liberal rabbis of that period, from conservative to Jewish renewal. They were also very uncomfortable with the American sexual revolution from another side. And here I'm going to go specifically continue with Art Green. Art, we Jews should stand opposed to the current moves toward the demystification of sexuality, which seek to define coupling as a purely biological function. You can already hear things that, of course, are so obvious in our generation of a hookup generation, of Tinder, of sexuality as a personal need, a personal pleasure, and as long as you can find a partner that you're not coercing, me too is very important here, then you do whatever you want for as long as you want. Sex has nothing to do with ethics, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with spirituality, and nothing necessarily to do with a commitment to love. And Art Green is objecting to that. We are made most fully human by the fact that this act, shared by us with the animal kingdom, can be raised in our consciousness to the rung of the sublime mystery of union. Sexuality at its fullest is brimming with religious and spiritual intentionality. Now, that becomes really the call of my book. Can I find within halachic traditions, and I will find debates, of course, resources that can help to make the sexual and love relationship into one that does have sanctity, that can be raised to a higher level, not by denying the sexual and natural aspects of the desire for orgasm and for satis sexual satisfaction, but actually integrating them. And that's what led me to say, what can the halachic tradition offer us? And has it grown over time? Or is it bankrupt as, it, as Arthur Green felt it was at that period early in his career? So I would say there was two things that were important here. The first thing was to go back to halacha in terms of an ethics of the mitzvah of onah. And here I didn't do a great deal of work in the book. I'll just point out the basic principle. Certainly the Me Too movement has made us very conscious of the fact that in the realm of sexual intimacy and in the realm of love more generally, we find human beings to be most vulnerable, most exposed, most easily exploited and abused. And in that context, it's very often women who are the ones who suffer the most from that oppression. And within marriage, we find the same thing. We find that marriage also is a realm in which we can have that oppression and that uh, as, as an issue. And so already, I think we need a halachic context 
in order to guarantee human rights and human moral decency, especially because of the, the emotional and the erotic exposure we have within this kind of a relationship. And in fact, the first time they talk about mar marital and sexual relations in law in the Torah, back in Sefer Shemot, we see we're talking about a polygamous husband, clearly in a patriarchal society. A husband should treat his wife in accord with Mishpat Banot, the law of what turns out to be married women. So if he marries an additional wife, he must not deprive his wife of the classical threesome, She'erak, Suta, and Onata. If he does not provide these three, she exits the marriage. It becomes a kind of a right to divorce that he can't hold her back. He also can't if he bought her in some way, he can't sell her. So, and here we know that classic ways in which Rashi has interpreted those rules. And Ona, that is understood by the rabbis, perhaps not the original pshat, meaning the right quantitatively to a certain number of times of sexual intercourse. It's a right of the woman. It's a contractual right that she has. And it has to do with how much time the husband has for it, depending on his profession. But I'd like to point at what Ramban does, in which he interprets all three of these terms as related to the issue of the quality of the interpersonal relationship of Ona. She'era, he says is a term for a flesh and blood relative, She'er Besaro. It recalls Adam and Eve who became one flesh, um, Basar Echad, in the garden, one family. But it may also mean that she, the spouse, the woman, may not be deprived of the touch of flesh of her husband. He is not to follow the Persian custom of having intercourse in his clothes. So there is a halachic, demand that if a man or a woman refuse to take off their clothes when they're having when they're having a, a intimate relationship that's grounds for divorce on both sides in other words separate from the question of procreation or even sexual satisfaction there's something about the physical touch which has to do with intimacy that has a tremendous value we're going to see that the hasidic community has rejected ramban and that halachic tradition completely Suit. What does he do with clothing? He says bed clothes, her linens. She must be wooed in her bed in an honorable fashion, not on the floor like a prostitute. Now, the part about the prostitute is important because it says that in the relationship of man and woman, we have to maintain the dignity, here the dignity of the woman. And the way you do it is by going, this is sort of an advertisement, to go to my wife's favorite store, which is uh, bath, bed, bath, and beyond. I don't know if it still exists after the age of Corona, because that creating the scenery of the bedroom is in fact an essential part of how you're relating to this woman. Plus the notion that the woman has to be wooed. Maimonides makes this explicit in the notion that there can't be any coercion in marriage, that you can't say, because we got married, because I have my sexual rights and you have, therefore I have the right to force you to have sex. No, you have to treat each engagement sexually with your partner in which it has to go back to the question of appeasing, arousing desire and gaining consent. And last of all, Ramban says, Ona is her times of lovemaking regularly scheduled, even if a second wife is taken. Notice he's taken Ona, he's gone to the, la the language of the Song of Songs, Eight Dodim is the term he uses, and he's talking about sex as an expression of a love relationship, which adds a whole nother aspect. So it seems to me that one of the directions the rabbis go as sexual ethics is to talk about sort of an aspiration and a minimal demand on having a relationship of dignity, of interpersonal love, and of a physical intimacy, independent even from sexual intimacy. Now, notice that in the biblical period, we have almost no treatment, and here I'm going to stop sharing for a minute, we have almost no treatment of marriage as a matter of kedusha. There's a contractual relationship, 
The Bible, of course, talks about Kiddusha as Prushim to you, as Rashi interprets Kiddoshim to you, that you have to be separated off. There's a danger, of course, that sexuality can cause Tum'ah, impurity, that keeps you away from the temple. There's, of course, the problem of adultery, that if you violate your commitment, if your wife who's married, violates her commitment and commits adultery, then that's a violation of sanctity as well. And there's a higher spiritual goal of sanctity in which you separate off from uh, from things that are related to the knanim, incest and adultery, being related to the ways of avodazara, of idolatry. So when sanctity is discussed, discussed in terms of the sacred, it's for the most part discussed in terms of how we have to separate. It's not discussed in terms of how the coming together of the couple is an act of sacred unity. And in that, from that learning of that history, going back among others to the scholar Moshe David Hare on the rabbinic tradition, he says Kiddushin is called Kiddushin, but it has nothing to do with making the union of the couple sacred. So as opposed to things that I found from Rav Soloveitchik in modern orthodoxy through every single uh, liberal American rabbi who talks about the kiddushin, the term we use for engagement as a sign that this marriage has to be a sacred relationship, all of them in that sense agreeing with Art Green and opposing a American sexual revolution that reduces sexuality merely to something physiological and natural desires. Despite that, at least in the time of the Talmud, Kiddushin does not seem to talk about the sanctity of coming together, but only sanctity expressed in sexuality by separation. In the Middle Ages, both with Maimonides from a philosophic point of view and from uh, Rav Yosef Karo from a mystical point of view, the emphasis became on a marriage that within marriage where in principle sexual contact is obliga obligatory from a contractual point of view, nevertheless, there's an aspiration and even halachic guidance for marital asceticism. The less contact you have with your own body, and certainly with the body of your, of your wife, the less conversation you have with your wife, the less your desires are aroused in any way, the more sacred the act. In fact, Kadeshet Atzmecha Bamutar Lecha in the Middle Ages comes to mean make sanctity, the sanctity of separation and asceticism, do that in the realm in which God has made it permitted to you. In other words, much of the medieval discussion, either into the modern period, is not about halacha in the sense of what's demanded of everyone. Maimonides said that for the average everyday husband and wife, Rav is the model we should follow and therefore there should be joy involved in it. But the lifnim mishurat adin, higher spiritual aspiration, both for the philosophic Maimonides and for the Kabbalists, and certainly for Yosef Karo, was the less involvement you have with your sexual contact with your wife, the better it is. And therefore they went back to Rabbi Eliezer in the Talmud, who talks about having sex with uncovering his and his wife's clothing to the minimal, the functional minimal, like the Persians, if you will, and talked about acting as if his desire had taken him over like a demon, or as if he's only paying a debt to his wife according to the contract, that became the model. In the modern period, that notion of Kiddusha is the one that dominates really in the Hasidic community, the most extreme version being in the contemporary Hasidic community, represented by uh, the Gera Hasidim, but also clearly reflective for those of you who've seen the movie Unorthodox in the Sutmer community, in the Slonim community, in the Toldos Aaron community, and more generally a part of an ethos of Hasidut, which is not about Avodah Begashmiut in the bedroom. It's not about worshiping God through your physicality when you're in the bedroom. There is a positive attitude toward the physical in Hasidut, but not toward the sexual, the sexual embodiment of the human being. And all of that came to its really its height with the Gera Hasidim, who I'll mention in a moment. At the same time in the Middle Ages, we have the birth of a conceptual revolution. And here I'm following the understanding of Kabbalah, of what could be called the Jerusalem School of Kabbalah, 
That's Moshe Idel. That's uh, Yehuda Libis. It's their student Malila uh, uh, Heller Eshed, Helner Eshed, as opposed to uh, Elliot Wolfson in the United States. And that is the notion that what Kabbalah did was it invented a new notion of sanctity, the sanctity of union, the coming together of complementary opposites, not in a hierarchical fashion, but in a horizontal equality. And while none of these historians of the Kabbalah claim that that actually changed the everyday relationship between a mystic and his wife in their bedroom, Nevertheless, it conceptually made the sexual events in the bedroom into things of cosmic significance for tikkun olam and for the tikkun of God himself. And therefore, suddenly we have a positive attitude towards that sexual union, which has its greatest influence on Shabbat, because of course the Kabbalists reconceived Shabbat in which sexual relationship was not only oneg Shabbat, it was a, the sacred act of helping to bring together the male and the female aspects of the divine. And in fact, everyone and everything has both a male and a female aspect. And bringing them together is the way in which we redeem the world. And it starts with the interpersonal relationship of the mystic and his wife, it appears. Now, it's that which led me to probably my most interesting discoveries in the study of this text, and I'm going to show you a text that Benny Brown, the professor at the Hebrew University, has brought out in a great deal. And we're going to look at one of the most anti-feminist, anti-modern, anti-democratic people I can think of, the Chazon Ish. All right. So the Chazon Ish, uh, he could have written the book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. That is the notion that men and women are fundamentally different in their personalities, in their sexual needs, in their relationships overall. And yet, the Chazon Ish, responding, it seems, to the Ger Hasidim, who issued very, very strong restrictions for their whole community on marital intimacy, he went the opposite direction. Let me remind you for a moment what the Ger Hasidim taught. From 1948, the Gerach I think he's the fifth of the Gerach Hasidim, of the Rebbe's. And he said, number one, you should only have Ona once a month. Number two, you should never talk to your spouse. Just give instructions. Never call each other by your first name. Have sex only with clothing on and it helps to have tzitzit on as quickly as possible. As if you're coerced by a demon. Rabbi Eliezer is the standard here. And it affects not only the bedroom, it affects their total relationship. Because husband and wife should never walk together. They should never be in an elevator together. They should never sit together on a, in, in the back of a taxi or next to each other on an airplane. In other words, the notion of restricting sexuality became a restriction on every aspect and therefore the emotional intimacy of marriage was totally destroyed in a very consistent way, not only for Hasidic rabbis who'd often been ascetic, but for every single member of the Hasidic community. Again, not because it's the halacha. The Hasid is not interested in the halacha. He has an aspiration to higher spirituality, higher asceticism, and therefore Dafka in the one realm in which it's, there's no prohibition on male and female sexual contact, that's the place where the true Chassid has to show his colors and achieve his great conquest of Yetzer, of his desire, and that's where sanctity is. So the bedroom for the Gerach Hasidim became the most important arena for the redemption of the world through the, the husband's relationship to his sexuality and the woman, her job, was simply to be instrumental in helping her husband to achieve this higher level of spirituality through asceticism. Now, it's against that Hasidic view that the head of the Litvak movement, the Chazon Ish, who is known for being super strict in halacha, very strict about gender segregation within the ultra-Orthodox world, totally a man who was opposed to any university education, not a feminist, not an egalitarian, not a person who had a positive attitude toward the body in general, and certainly an anti-Zionist. And yet, he sent out a little letter somewhere around 1950, never even officially published, 
And this is how he totally transforms the rhetoric and the ideal of what marital intimacy is about. And so let me show you this. Okay. The first thing he does is he says, it's an obligation to devote a year to make his wife happy, as it says. So he says there's a mitzvah in the Torah that doesn't allow us, if we want to, to forego sexual and emotional intimacy. No, we have a mitzvah de oraita that tells us we have to make our wives happy for a whole year. Notice, it may be that in the literal meaning in the Torah, happy means sexual, as it often does in that context of marriage. Instead, here, he clearly understands it to be emotional happiness. And then he becomes a psychologist. And here's a picture of the Chazanish. And he says, it is her nature... You can see he has a notion that men and women have different essential nat natures, if you will, Mars and Venus. It is her nature to find joy in the way she finds favor in her husband's eyes. It's not so much the wife as the enabler, but it is the wife who cares very much about what her husband thinks about her. Her, her interpersonal, as, as is often a typical cliche in... in uh, in the West today, that women are concerned with relationships and men are concerned with sex. I'm not interested in whether that's true, whether it's essentially true, but for him it is. Her eyes are directed to him expectantly. Therefore, he must make an effort to show her love and closeness in words of conversation and appeasement. We have the conversation mode which we had with Rav, but it's expanded from the bedroom into the overall relationship between the two of them. For a whole year, he should do nothing but make her happy through conversation, and through conversation is not at all a simple notion for a Haredi. Why? Because actually we have Pirkei Avot, which the rabbis turned into a mitzvah de Rabbanan, a rabbinic law that says you're not supposed to talk to your wife a lot. You're not supposed to have long conversations with your spouse. So what does he do? He says he should tell his wife whenever he leaves the house where he is going. And upon his return, tell her what he has done. And other little things and words of reinforcement to make her heart happy. So his notion is that small talk, right? Because, of course... You can't have them sharing what he taught in Talmud. They live in different worlds. But they can at least be in touch with each other, always know, where am I going? Thus, one is exempt from the rabbinic prohibition against having too much conversation with one's wife whenever she is in need of appeasement during the first year. And students of the, of the Chazon Ish said that in our generation, because we're such a corrupted generation, it may take two years, it may take five years, it might take ten years. In other words, the whole pattern of interpersonal relationships, of emotional intimacy, is radically changed. And he condemns the Hasidim who think that they have the right to encourage women and men to forego this conversation because they're achieving a higher spirituality. He says, what are you talking about? We have a halacha here. Now, there's almost no one who ever treated the uh, exemption from the, uh, from the army in the Torah and the need to keep your wife happy for a year that turned it into a halachic text that becomes a, a, it comes useful and used every day. So let me keep going. In the first year, one must make an effort to achieve unity, which is the creator's intention, as it says, to become one flesh, for the Shekhinah to dwell between them. So here he's offering an Agadah to reinforce his halacha. And the Agadah is that God, God in, in creation wanted man and woman to become one flesh, and that would be bringing the, the Shekhinah into this world between them. So there's a spiritual goal, there's sanctity that you're creating in the world in your interpersonal love relationship. And then he says something quite interesting. Sometimes treating one's spouse with respect and dignity, with the awe of politeness, displays lack of intimacy. 
There is something about when you enter into that interpersonal realm in which you have to leave behind the distance, even if it's the distance of politeness. One must relate with a greater intimacy than can be accommodated in a relationship of respectful honor. Levity and lightheartedness, kalut rosh, again, we're back to Rav in his bed, are more lovable than serious and awesome honor. One must make every effort to behave in a more intimate way, to draw her closer with one's right hand rather than pushing her away with one's left. One should address her in familiar singular you, not the formal plural characteristic of polite speech in Yiddish. Right? Now, this is a some short letter. You know, it's about a couple of paragraphs. It's not a major campaign to transform marriage. And yet, some of the students of the Chazon Ish and of his brother-in-law, Yaakov Kanievsky, and others, they began in the late 90s and 2000s to write a whole series of best-selling books for yeshiva students in the Litvak world to talk about the way in which marriage and emotional as well as sexual and erotic uh, coming together becomes a major sacred task. I will give you one example of it because you can see how he's taken the notion of small talk between husband and wife to make them happy and turned it into basically what a, a way to achieve full humanity as God intended. The Torah established that the only way for a person to be complete, a notion that already appears in Rebbeinah Midrash, that man and woman only become fully ha'adam when they're zachar unekeva, when they become one, and not a mere half, is to be united as man and a woman in marriage. So their whole lives lived in mutuality, each must learn about the other half. The result will be a whole human being, a person who has both a male and female perspective on the whole of creation. This is not about sex anymore. However, what happens in reality instead, he knows what's really happening, of a man learning the female perspective on the creation, he insists stubbornly that he remain in his narrow male perspective even after marriage, and he misses the main purpose of marriage. As long as one has not emerged from the small viewpoint of one person, one is still in the beginning stages of marriage. The first year is a full year of work. There's an emotional work you have to do to become acquainted with the other side of the coin. There's a learning activity. It's a cognitive exchange. And in fact, our rabbis have taught that a year is only a minimum time frame for such a work, etc., etc. It might take five years, whatever, but that's what it means to become a true married couple. Suddenly, the nature of the coming together is great, and in other texts, they talk about how this is the notion of tikkun olam. This is in the Haredi popular literature written for yeshiva students because it has to do with what we most need in our lives, and what God wants from his world, and here they quote the Maharal of Prague, we want ichud, the unity, we want love, we want peace, not only shalom bayit, which is domestic tranquility, but a shalom that brings the whole of all of the complex forces into a larger harmony, and marriage is the first place that begins the process of learning about that other half of the world so we can really bring it together. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop and see if there's any questions, is to point out an incredible friend who was a friend of the Chazonish, who was a Musernik like no other Musernik I've ever read about, Rav Yitzchak Isaac Sher, and he wrote a 30-page piece, not only for yeshiva students, but also for their wives. And he established the first courses in yeshivot back in 1950 and before for guiding, first of all, uh, counseling uh, bridegrooms and then also brides so that they will fully understand what's involved in marriage. And he, as an educator, looked at his own Haredi community and he said, the virtue of love is not properly developed among us Haredim. And then he goes on to say how we have to teach people about natural bodily desire. And that's an essential for the core of sanctity is the union which can only come about through powerful love between them, 
so they become one in body and soul. Now, what is the core of that love? The core of that love is desire. Desire, yetzer, ta'ava, terms that are always negative within rabbinic tradition when applying to men and women's relationships. He says that's the key. The whole problem is that these charedim, he says, think that desire is impure. When in fact, the Jewish people, Kiddushat Yisrael, is able to transfer desire into sanctity. And here he quotes the Igeret HaKodesh from the 13th century that makes that argument against Maimonides. And then because he's a Musernik, he gives all kinds of techniques. If you'd like to write some of these down for your love relationships, how we can reinforce love so that every month after the menstrual period of separation, when husband and wife come back together, then they can reachieve the same level of a honeymoon every single month. Now, how do you do that? So he says, first of all, he quotes Rav about the importance of lightheadedness. Then he says that the wife as well as the husband is interested in this renewed honeymoon. And then he does something I've never seen before. He quotes Shira Shirim, the Song of Songs, not as a book which is only an allegory for, for the relationship of Israel and God, but as a, as a literal description and a halachic guidance for how man and woman should see themselves as Anila Dodi Vidodi Li. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. And then he says, you should keep a little pinkas a little notebook from your wedding celebration from the Sheva Brachot with all of the words of love and compliments that they spoke to one another and they should reread them every month to return to that status. And he suggests the use of guided imagery therapy during intercourse, both for the man and for the woman, to imagine themselves back in the Garden of Eden and he says, then the woman is filled with love and pleasure arising from sanctity and spiritual elevation so that when she reaches the apex of the act of intercourse, she is fully intoxicated, hovering in the world of imagination. Then she sees pleasant dreams illustrated with beautiful images. So, like a Musernik, he has techniques for working on your character, but he's using these techniques in order to work on the interpersonal relationship with his both erotic and sexual and spiritual all at the same time, transforming desire into a, into a notion of sanctity. So let me stop at this point. If there's comments or questions, and at the very end, I want to show you one photograph before we say goodbye tonight. Okay, um, great. Can you hear me, uh, Noam? Yes, perfectly. You can. Okay, um, I'm going to leave you still on screen. You know what? I can add myself so people that can see me as well. Um, and uh, let me just here. Um, I'm going to also let me see if this adds spotlight. If oh, it looks like I just replaced you. So let me see if I can um, add a spotlight for you, and we will be either on top of each other or side by side. Um, and I don't mean sexually. <laughs> um, so, um, first of all, a lot of your viewers are evidently teachers of one sort or another. Uh, and so I, I just want to draw your attention to that. And several people asked about sources and study guide and so forth. And I uh, just wrote this, but I just want to reiterate, and you can add to it if you like, you shared sources with us before this for us to distribute. And after the talk, everyone who has registered for this, we will distribute the sources. Is it also a study guide or just a compilation of sources? This is a compilation of sources from which I teach the book. But I'm very happy if anybody wants to write a letter to me, uh, noam.cion at gmail, to answer, to respond, to share the Hebrew sources where I have them. Be very happy and to enter into a conversation, as well as, of course, to help teach by Zoom if, they, if, they're, are, if they're involved in teaching this in any of their congregations or educational settings. Okay, wonderful. Um, one of the earliest questions uh, related to the question of obligation, that uh, sexual contact, husband with wife, or in some of the alternative or expanded versions, uh, the obligation for intimacy more broadly conceived, did anyone ever formulate a blessing for this intimacy? And if not, why not? 
<laughs> That's a very good question. There is one uh, blessing that uh, from an from a source that's not attributed uh, that Moshe Edel brings from medieval Kabbalah, I think from from Tzvat, which is a kind of blessing over it. But it's true that uh, there are no there is no specific blessing for for the uh, the sexual act. Um, there well there's other discussions about that. For example, there's also no mitzvah for giving tzedakah. Uh, and uh, so that's it's a larger question of what things get brachot and what don't. But okay. it doesn't mean it doesn't have sacred significance, and it doesn't mean it's not a mitzvah, but it's true, it hasn't been ritualized that way. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Um, there uh, was one questioner in the midst of this, I don't, I don't think your ongoing presentation changed the question, um, but I'll just, you know, straight out the way it was written, who in a relationship has the right to demand sex, if any partner? <laughs> so, um, of course, one of the interesting things in the Talmud is that they almost never, in fact, I don't think they ever talk about the woman's obligation to have sex with her husband. They're only interested in protecting the woman's right within the contract. So some of the later halachic authorities say, well, if she, he has an obligation to her of a certain number of times, then of course she has the obligation to him. So it's interesting that they didn't raise that to the level of halacha for the most part. The question about whether you can demand your sexual needs, which are your contractual rights, that's an interesting one. So in uh, some of, in, in Eruvin, there is a whole discussion about one of the curses of women that continues since the curse of Eve. And one of the curses is that when a woman has desire, she is not supposed to, from the point of view of politeness, from the point of view of recommended uh, behavior, she's not supposed to litboa bape. She's not supposed to demand it with her mouth directly, even though she has a legal right. And if the husband refused to have intercourse, she could go to court and she could get a, an order for grounds for divorce. Um, in fact, that's how they, they understand it as a curse because the curse in the Garden of Eden in chapter three of Genesis is the, the El Ishech Teshukatech Vahuyim Sholbach. You will have a greater desire for your, to, to your husband perhaps greater than his desire to you, and because you're the needy one, therefore he will rule over you. It's, of course, one of the cursed things that hierarchy is generated under an asymmetry of need, and of course, as long as you have a polygamous society, the husband has more than one possibility for sexuality, or even having simply sex outside of marriage is not a form of adultery for the man. So the asymmetry of the basic situation is there. I think that what Maimonides does, and here he's summarizing things that are also in the Gomorrah, also in Eruvim, is that the husband should not be forcing himself on the wife. Now, of course, forcing, if it meant rape, would clearly be uh, forbidden. And as you know, within the British law tradition up until 1970, also in American, there was no notion of rape within marriage because you'd agree to the sexual needs. Plus, the British notion was that the husband and wife are one organic unit. The <laughs> husband is the head of that organic unit. And of course, he can make the decisions unilaterally. But even in the rabbinic tradition in which there's a contract in which we can talk about mutual legal responsibilities for sex, you can't take it. You have to woo. You have to appease. You have to generate desire. And you have no, you really, other than going to demand a divorce, you have no other alternative than the persuasion. I think that's one of the great blessings of the rabbinic tradition that goes beyond law is that they demanded there be an ongoing fixing of the relationships. So in the Middle Ages, when they began to take the advice in Pirkei Avot seriously about not talking too much to a woman, even to your wife, then they say, but if their relationships are a little rocky and she's angry at you, then you have a right to talk to her. In other words, there's a concern for Shalom Bait as the baseline for having intimate intercourse and therefore, the rabbis defined force as any, as, as any, for, as not just physical force, but any kind of coercion which is not based on the woman's desire, her willingness, her active willingness, then that's already forbidden. 
And what about the category of the moreta, the rebellious wife, which includes the wife who refuses to have sexual relations? Um, well, you have that, and you also have the category of moreta, husband who also refuses to have. Mm -hmm. that. That's, of course, the extreme case, because that's the nature, as you know very well, you're the editor of the book on the Jewish family, that, uh, that when you go to law, when you go to court, when you go to coercion, the legal coercion, you're dealing with the most extreme cases. Mm -hmm. This book is much more concerned about the realm in which it's not enforced. It's mm -hmm. about how people are educated, sometimes brainwashed, to have a certain kind of relationship beyond the power of, uh, of God in your bedroom, the rabbi in your bedroom, or the constitution in your bedroom. Okay. Um, one questioner um, was wondering, uh, in the teaching where the, the honeymoon teaching, the first year, the obligation to make your wife happy, um, is it possible they wanted to know that that could mean make pregnant? No, I think absolutely not. There's no suggestion of that in any of the materials that I've seen. No, I don't think so. I also don't think it fits with the word list samer to make her happy. Um, and again, that's part of the revolution. It's not a one-time act which might be a purely physiological act that gets the woman pregnant, which is really serving your own needs because only the man is obligated for procreation, according to the, the halakha, but rather they've stretched it out to a time period in which the total relationship has to be one of simcha and beyond simcha. Okay, good. Um, are there other questions here? I, I think I captured most of what had been put on chat uh, during the presentation, but... We've got a few minutes, so somebody want to uh, throw your thought or comment, question. Um, I see uh, Judah, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, you have a raised hand. Could you uh, put the question into chat? Um, I, I, I was the person who asked about becoming pregnant. I just thought it's not about one physical act. I, I wonder whether this joy would also be the joy of motherhood for the woman. I mean, in a more broad mm. sense, I mean, to make sure that she, um, before the her husband departs after one year to the military service and might never come back and she might never be able to become a mother uh, uh, afterwards. I mean, to, to connect sexuality, not only with intimacy, but also with motherhood or fatherhood. That's a, that's a beautiful interpretation. I haven't seen it in any of the texts that deal with that question, and nor in the contemporary attempts to revive that as a mitzvah and to make it explicit. So that I, but also a wonderful notion. And it is true that Rav Soloveitchik in his work talks about the import, uh, what, what having a child adds to the quality of the marital relationship. For the most part, the book that I wrote is about the, the bilateral relationship of, the, of, husband, of, of spouses. However, he says that specifically the willingness to have a child is part, totally transforms the relationship because it becomes an intergenerational one. And that's certainly something to explore going beyond the I thou to the I thou and the child and how that that generative notion of love transforms, hopefully in a positive way, the relationship. Great. And while you were uh, th thank you for that uh, for clarifying that question, really wonderful interpretation. Um, and I'm going to make this the last question, Noam, because I actually have to prepare for um, a presentation I'm giving over Zoom in a half hour. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, um, so somebody wants to know about the relationship of these attitudes and the changes in Jewish attitudes through the years and in different places to attitudes regarding sexuality in the broader cultures in which Jews live. To what degree was there influence and reflection there? Uh, and, um, you know, was there a distinctive distinction be between Ashkenazi and Sephardi as well, although the broader question would apply there, I think it's fair to say, at the same time. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Great. It's a great question. I Let me only respond to the part that I know about, because for a lot of things I don't know, for example, the Sephardi and the Ashkenazi. 
But I will point out something. Look, I'm not trying to idealize the Haredi Litva community. It's a, I mean, the major emphasis in terms of attitudes towards sexuality is the separation of, of, uh, of boys and girls from the age of two, the concern that two-year-old children in, kinder, in, in nursery schools, when they take a nap, they always lie on their back um, and never on their front, and that they always keep their hands above the cover so there won't be any kind of sexual stimulation. This is a culture which is, which is totally obsessive about the danger of desire. It's one of the amazing things and perhaps impossible things of the Litvak ideal that how you've never had a conversation with somebody from the other sex. You have no idea how your physiology, let alone the sexual physiology of your partner works, and suddenly you enter into marriage and you're supposed to have these conversations and develop an emotional and an erotic intimacy. That's an incredibly different task, difficult task. And I'm not at all sure that they're successful in that role, but they have changed the language of the spiritual ideal to make trying to make that work into an ideal. I think in the Amer in in the American context, of course, a lot of work has been done uh, on talking about sanctity. I think probably the most interesting work is the work done by Rachel Adler in her book in which not only, not only does she try to address what she considers patriarchal aspects of, uh, of Judaism, of rabbinic Judaism, but she tries to create a new halakha. She's not anti-halakha. A new halakha, a halakha based on partnership, taking the terms used in the Geniza fragments from a thousand years ago, in which husband and wife are referred to as shutafi, my partner, having instead of a ring ceremony to have a little bag, a kitty, in which each one puts something into the bag, something physical, and that's part of their shared partnership. But she also is working on the realm of agada, Because I think, again, it's not enough to change the law if you don't change the whole rationale. And she goes back not only to the Garden of Eden and to the Sheva Brachot that speaks of Re'im Ahuvim, loving friends. She goes back to the Song of the Songs as Isaac Sher does. And she says, here we have a notion of sexual, of eros, of desire, of playfulness, often expressed in a woman's voice. And we need to bring that into the partnership. And that's the agada that goes along with the halacha. Wonderful. Uh, I, this is only uh, the beginning of a conversation. Uh, the abundance of for sources you include is really quite remarkable. Everyone can expect that we will shortly distribute uh, the sources to everybody. And uh, Noam, thank you so much. For those of you who are here on the call, let me invite you. Wednesday night, we've got another book talk, uh, which promises to be uh, very, very interesting. It's for this book here, When I Grow Up by Ken Krimstein, uh, The Lost Autobiographies of Six Yiddish Teenagers, it is a graphic book, um, but very, very serious and something that we will all uh, learn something considerable from the presentation. So I invite you back then. Please be in touch with us uh, if you don't know how to sign up. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, how do we purchase the book if we want it, Noam? Uh, there's Amazon and there's JPS and lots of ways to do it. Let me just end with one photograph. Please. Okay, one photograph. Um, here, it, oh, here it is. There it is. Okay, so this is a photograph of my teacher, Menachem Froman, who was a very unusual uh, Balchuva and a Rav living in the West Bank who had close relationships with um, religious leaders of Hamas, of the most extreme Muslims. And so he was a popular person for people to come and interview. So this photograph was taken when a journalist at the end of his interview said, I'd like a photo of you, Reb Menachem. And he said, only if my wife is in the picture, and he has a wonderful wife, Hadassah, and uh, they came together. And then he said to the photographer, something important for us. He said, I want you to focus the camera on the space right between my head and my wife's head, because that's where the Shekhinah is. That's where the divine present is. So this is a photograph of God. And I think what we're called upon is to make sure that we bring more of the Shekhinah into our lives through our interpersonal love relationships. Wonderful. Laila Tov. Okay, thank you. Good night to you and good afternoon to everybody who's a little bit earlier in the day. Please come back for uh, other talks and events. Bye-bye. Lovely.